All right, so let's get uh, going on uh, today's class. So um, this is what was supposed to happen uh, last week. So uh, last week, class, uh, classes were canceled. Uh, hopefully you've seen the announcement. Um, I suffered a concussion. Just to kind of fill you in on what, uh, what happened. So I was uh, cycling in to work, and uh, unfortunately... A turn that I've taken millions of times before just kind of didn't work out this time. So that's sideways going back up to uh, properly oriented. So that's my regular commute to work. I have done that turn so many times I can't even, you know, begin to tell you. Um, it, uh, I've not uh, previously didn't even have so much as a wobble and this time just totally uh, wiped out. So uh, smashed my uh, head on uh, what I imagine to be the side of the curb, so that's uh, the damage uh, that occurred. There's a little close-up of it. Uh, that's gone, thankfully, cosmetically. Um, my eye's still a little bit black, but uh, I did suffer a concussion, so the rest of the week uh, was taken off from that concussion. And one of the weird things, uh, when you have a concussion, I don't know, hopefully not too many of you have had this experience, but I cannot remember anything about the accident. So I, I did not know when I showed up to work that I had gotten into an accident. I did not know that I had fallen down. I knew that I felt weird, but I did not know that I had fallen down. Um, I don't remember falling down. I do not remember how I got to the university. So from that corner, to the university is about five more minutes of cycling. I do not remember traversing that at all. My first memory is looking at my watch in my office and making the decision that I was going to be late for class if I changed into my work clothes. So I went to class in my cycling clothes. And uh, that was the earliest memory um, that I had. Um, I had my cell phone running and recording when I rode in uh, to class that day. So that's the only reason that I have any sort of evidence of um, what happened. So it's almost like watching yourself in a found footage horror film, you know, where you don't know what happened, but you're, you're piecing together all these, uh, uh, all these clues. And I uh, just kind of, I don't know if I'll ever see this person again, but somebody with hair like that was nice enough to actually stop and, and help me. So I don't have their face on the video, but they, they stopped, you know, I could hear the audio. Are you okay? Are you all right? Uh, they must have helped me up. They reattached my cell phone to my, uh, to my bike. So I just want to throw this out to the universe. Whoever has that hair, thank you very much for, <laughs> for being, uh, you know, for helping me out that day, for stopping. They didn't have to. I mean, you always hear a lot of times in psychology, you'll learn about the bystander effect where people don't stop to help. So it's nice to uh, at least acknowledge in spirit somebody who actually did take time out of their day to help somebody that wiped out and uh, suffered a concussion. So I ended up going to the ER. Uh, they did a CT scan. There was no fracture. There was no bleeding in my brain, but I did have a concussion. And I did not know this, but one of the things that happens after a concussion is you have to undergo what's known as brain rest. So for a minimum of 48 hours, and I pushed it a little bit longer, uh, you have to rest your brain, which means uh, no sports. So, you know, you don't want to get injured again, but... No schoolwork, uh, no computers, no screens, no TV. So you literally try to shut off your brain as much as possible. So I broke these rules a couple of times just to let the chair of the department know that I was all right and to let uh, everybody else here know that classes were going to be canceled. But, um, yeah, if you didn't receive an email from me until yesterday, uh, I was under doctor's brain rest orders. And then uh, one last thing I'm going to mention. This is a little bit of my um, PSA. Uh, so these were some of the injuries uh, that I sustained. And uh, it would have been a lot worse if I was not wearing my helmet. So uh, I have read so many articles where people are like, I'm not going to wear a helmet. When I'm cycling, I'm not going to wear a helmet. Because if you get hit by an SUV, a helmet's not going to make any difference. And it's true, I'll paraphrase Jerry Seinfeld, if you ever get hit by an SUV, your bicycle helmet is now wearing you for protection, right? But I did not get hit by an SUV. I took a turn that I have taken hundreds of times before 
and I slipped out. And luckily I was wearing my helmet. So my head looked like this and you can see the cracks in the helmet where it landed on the sidewalk and took the brunt of the injury. So the only reason that I'm standing here today and I can teach after a week of, you know, recovery is because of, this is going to go into my Hall of Fame, because of my helmet that saved my head. So if you're a cyclist out there or if you know cyclists that don't wear helmets, uh, you know, take care of yourself. Let them know this is literally you are here developing this. All right. This is literally your money maker. So protect it. And like I said, you know, I've taken that turn a hundred times. I am a very experienced cyclist. I've commuted by bike for, you know, years and years and years now. Never once in my entire life have I fallen. But thankfully, I wear a helmet every single time so that my helmet is cracked, uh, but my skull is not. All right, but back to business as usual. So uh, to kind of make up for the week that uh, that we missed, uh, double check the syllabus. I, up I uploaded a post-concussion medical leave syllabus that has new due dates, all right? So new due dates, new times for quizzes, new times for exams. So make sure that at some point in the near future, log on to Canvas, check out that new syllabus and check out the new uh, the new due dates. And then um, also uh, to make up for the week that we missed, much like when we missed uh, a class because I was away at a conference earlier on, we're going to have two special online classes distributed throughout the remainder of the semester. So double check the syllabus for when those online classes are. I'm going to post them on a Friday. So you'll have the Friday, the Saturday, the Sunday, the Monday uh, to hopefully watch them before class next, next time. We're only going to have two of those to get us caught up for the rest of the semester. So also check the syllabus for when those will be uh, available. So one of the first um, things that uh, <coughs> is gonna be affected is there was a sniffy assignment that was due. It was the final sniffy assignment, the uh, partial reinforcement, the effective uh, extinction on partial reinforcement. So that due date has been moved. So if you haven't done that one yet, make sure that you check the syllabus, get that in uh, on time. And we'll have something to say about that when we uh, continue with today's class. All right, so what we're gonna do today, the new stuff we're gonna do today, is we're gonna take a look at extinction and stimulus control. Specifically, we're gonna take a look at a very bizarre effect known as the peak shift effect, which can help us to explain uh, some extreme forms of behavior. So oftentimes, people engage in behavior that seems to be a little bit out there and difficult to explain why anybody would ever want that. Especially when you're doing behavior that you have never been reinforced previously for doing, the peak shift effect can help us explain why people would even desire to engage in those types of behaviors. And then we're gonna take a look at punishment and take a look at the different types of punishments and uh, the side effects of punishment. So punishment has its pros, has its cons in terms of uh, changing uh, an individual's behavior. So we'll take a look at the types and the pros and cons uh, that you need to be aware of before you implement a punishment contingency. But before we get to that new stuff, we do have a little bit of a wrap up for the Harry video still uh, remaining. So if you recall, Harry was a self injurious individual that Dr. Fox treated using a variety of different techniques. We analyzed some of those techniques. They were um, things that we've learned throughout the semester. Today we're gonna to finish off with some of the more recent ones that we've learned through the semester, starting with the response deprivation hypothesis. So uh, if you recall, in the uh, treatment of Harry, they removed Harry's restraints and Harry had to complete a task in order to earn those restraints back. So if Harry completed a task, he would receive his restraints and that was a positive consequence. So Harry finished the task. The task was the uh, operant um, behavior. Once he finished that task, he would be presented with something. He would be presented with his restraints and his probability of doing that task in the future went up. So the restraints were reinforcing. They were positive reinforcers. How do they know that the restraints were going to be reinforcing, especially since for most people, restraints would not be reinforcing. And the reason that Dr. Fox knew that going in, that restraints would be reinforcing, is because of the response deprivation hypothesis. 
So the response deprivation hypothesis says that a behavior, such as wearing restraints, is going to serve as a reinforcer when access to the behavior is restricted and its frequency falls below the preferred level of occurrence. And by taking away Harry's restraints, both of those conditions were satisfied. So when Dr. Fox made Harry take off the restraints, when he said, okay, take off the restraints and hand them to me, you know, I'm just going to hold on to them. As soon as he did that, Harry's access to his restraints, access to the behavior of wearing the restraints was restricted, and the frequency with which he was wearing restraints fell below the preferred level of occurrence, which was all the time. So even though they were only taking the restraints away for a couple of minutes when Harry was doing the task, or if he self-abused, they took the restraints away for an additional five minutes, even though that doesn't seem like a lot of time, it was enough for Harry's uh, frequency of wearing the restraints to fall below his preferred level, which is all the time. And because of that, they knew that they could use the restraints, give them back to Harry as a form of reinforcement for doing those other behaviors. All right, so we have an application of the response deprivation hypothesis to make the prediction that the restraints would be reinforcing. All right, and the last thing we're going to analyze is, uh, or second last thing, are some of the uh, extinction side effects. So as Harry was going through the extinction paradigm, as he was no longer being negatively reinforced for self-abuse, so the tasks were not being taken away because of Harry's self-abuse, he went through some extinction side effects. So one thing that we saw uh, was extinction first. So when he was in the beginnings of the extinction procedure, Harry's self-abuse actually increased in frequency. So there were periods, especially in the early going during the timeout phases, when Harry was just constantly self-abusing. And uh, maybe it's just my own subjective bias, but it seemed to be harder hits than it was previously. You could hear more of the impact than it was previously. That's an example of an extinction burst where the behavior that you're trying to get rid of, that you're trying to go through extinction, actually increases once the extinction paradigm is implemented. Important to know about extinction burst because to a non-psychologist, to somebody who has not been educated in psychology, extinction burst is com the complete opposite of what you want to occur. So you want the behavior to decrease, you put in the extinction uh, paradigm, and all of a sudden the behavior increases. It seems like everything is backfired. That's usually when people give up during the extinction burst. As a psychologist, it's important to know that that extinction burst, even though it's not desirable in the short term, is evidence that your extinction process is working and that you need to keep going, and eventually the behavior will decrease. Uh, other side effects of extinction that we saw, we saw increases in variability of the response. So we saw increases in the type of self-abuse that Harry would, uh, would do. So we saw that he predominantly hit himself in the, uh, in the face and the nose with his hands. But at one point he started biting himself as well. And then there was also a variability of other responses, such as tucking his hands into his own pants or clasping his hands. Here we see him self-restraining by backing into a corner and just trying to feel the restraint of, you know, mashing yourself up against the wall. Uh, I don't know how many shirts they went through. I think one time I tried counting and it was something like nine shirts where Harry was trying to put his hands into their shirts and self-restrain uh, in their shirts. So there was a variety of variable behavior that came out of the extinction procedure, things that they had not seen before. Uh, and this, is, again, is a side effect of that extinction procedure. Uh, emotional behavior typically referred as frustration. Uh, this was most easily observed in terms of Harry's vocalizations. So Harry was yelling a lot. He was yelling out, no, and he was screaming. He was like, ah, and he was like, help me, help me. None of those are indicators of anything else but him being extremely frustrated so we saw that extinction side effect of frustration. Um, we saw the extinction side effect of aggression, extinction-induced or frustration-induced aggression. 
And uh, thankfully, and this is kind of uh, one of the things that um, really gets to me when I watch this, uh, this video, is that Harry, throughout the video, just kind of shows that he is actually like a really cool guy. He just seems to be a nice human being. So when he was playing with Dr. Fox, you know, he was playing around with the ball, he threw it under his leg. He has a sense of humor. Um, he's very affectionate. He hugged Dr. Fox. Uh, later on, when Dr. Fox didn't interact with him as much because he was, you know, uh, elsewhere, he asked about Dr. Fox. So you can tell that he's an actually, um, you know, very um, uh, good human being. But even he had aggression. But notice that they mentioned that he was not, he never aggressed against the clinicians or the therapists, but he would aggress against other things like a table, like himself, like the door. So he was pounding on the door. That's an example of aggression. Uh, so again, these extinction side effects. Thankfully, though, he did not show that aggression uh, against other individuals, kind of showing that at core, uh, he's a very decent uh, human being. All right, other extinction side effects. Uh, resurgence, reappearance of other behaviors that had once been effective. Without knowing more about Harry's kind of behavior repertoire, we don't know if uh, resurgence occurred uh, very much in this uh, treatment, but it would have uh, been evidenced if there was any behaviors previously that had worked for Harry. For example, crying, um, sucking his thumb, uh, holding his breath, any of those behaviors, if they had come back, that would have been evidence of resurgence. Kind of hard to pick out without knowing more about Harry's previous uh, behaviors. Uh, other extinction side effects, um, depression, depressive-like symptoms. Harry was not happy going through extinction. There was a lot of crying. There was a lot of wailing. A lot of these depressive-like symptoms. All right, so those, those are some of the side effects that we saw. And then the last thing that we'll uh, review for the Harry video is the technique that we most recently looked at, which was the differential reinforcement of other behavior. So that's, the, uh, that's known as DRO, differential reinforcement of other behavior. It's a concurrent schedule, and it's a technique where you do an extinction schedule, and then at the same time, you include a new reinforcement schedule. So what this does is it allows the individual to still earn reinforcement. So one of the things with just a pure extinction procedure is that the possibility for reinforcement has disappeared, right? You're no longer getting any sort of reinforcement because extinction is where you remove the reinforcement for something that was previously reinforced. So one of the things that that does is it leads to desperation because the individual will think to themselves, where am I going to get some reinforcement? So the differential reinforcement of other behavior, you choose a behavior that's appropriate and you reinforce that behavior instead. So it's a concurrent schedule done at the same time and they have, uh, and that's the differential reinforcement of other behavior. The best version of it, a subset of it, is where the behavior that you choose to reinforce is incompatible with the behavior that you've chosen to go through extinction. So if you cannot do the behaviors at the same time, then that's the differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. So throughout the video, we saw this technique used. So this was used from the get-go. As soon as the extinction procedure was put into place, differential reinforcement of other behavior was also put into place. So the first example of the differential reinforcement of other behavior was the counting task. So they literally said, you're an extinction uh, paradigm right now or an extinction procedure. You will no longer be reinforced with the removal of a task for self-abuse. However, if you want some reinforcement, like your restraints back, count to 100, and we will reinforce that appropriate behavior of counting to 100. So counting to 100 is an example of the differential reinforcement of other behavior because you can still self-abuse yourself while you're counting to 100. You can actually literally just count how many times you hit yourself. You'd be like one, two, three, four. Those two behaviors are compatible with each other. So this would be an example of the differential reinforcement of other behavior.
A better technique that they also used was the differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. And one of the first examples of that was the ball throwing. So you cannot throw or catch a ball with your hands while you're still using your hands to self-abuse. And if you remember, they told Harry, if you drop the ball, we're leaving. We're going to leave with your restraints. So catching a ball, throwing a ball, that requires your hands. That is incompatible with self-abuse. And as you watch the video, it's an interesting how often Dr. Fox uses, uh, has Harry do tasks, especially tasks that he could do himself, but he, is pick, he picks them specifically because they involve Harry using his hands. So when they were doing the uh, work with the, uh, with the educational books, he had Harry bring in a table. There was no other reason for him to have Harry bring in a table other for him to be able to reinforce Harry for this behavior, bringing in the table, saying, good job, Harry, nicely done, Harry. And at the same time, Harry's using his hands. You cannot self-abuse if you're carrying a table. And we saw this example over and over and over again. So um, Dr. Fox, you know, gave Harry Coke and pretzels. And when Harry was like, you know, I, you know, I want a Coke. And he goes, you think you deserve a Coke? And he's like, yeah. And he goes, all right, pour yourself a Coke. Dr. Fox is completely capable of pouring a Coke for Harry. But he wanted to give Harry a behavior to do with his hands. He wanted Harry to have an incompatible behavior to do with his hands so he can reinforce it. So he had Harry pour his own Coke. He then asked Harry, can you pour me a little bit of Coke? He then had Harry do the cheers where, you know, you touch cups and then we drink. That's how you do it. All of these things were chosen because they involved Harry using his hands. So once again, pointing, you know, to different, uh, to the different animals. When Dr. Fox asked Harry, what are these animals? And Harry's like pig, you know, uh, rooster, duck. Dr. Fox said, no, point to them. You know, use your hands because you cannot point and self-abuse at the same time differential reinforcement of incompatible behavior. All right, so that ends our analysis of Harry. Any final questions? I know it's been a while, but uh, any questions or comments on Harry and his treatment and how he uses the techniques that we've learned in this class? All righty. Okay, so what we're going to do now, <coughs> we're going to go to the new stuff. We're going to introduce uh, the peak shift effect which is an effect that comes out of extinction and uh, stimulus control. And then uh, if we got time, we're going to take a look at uh, punishment, the different types of punishment and side effects uh, to be aware of when you do a punishment paradigm. All right, so back to Felix Baumgartner. So uh, in case you might have forgotten, Felix Baumgartner was the uh, first individual ever to skydive from outer space. And when you break this down, this is an incredibly bizarre behavior for anybody to do, specifically for anybody to want to do. So Felix Baumgartner skydove from outer space, free falls to Earth, breaks the sound barrier because he was going so fast, and it successfully lands on Earth and was ecstatic about having skydived from uh, space. So that joy right there is more straightforward to explain from a psychological perspective because he just did this behavior. He was just reinforced with success, right? So he made it down in one piece. He comes to the realization that he set the record. He's the first person in the history of the world to have done this. That's the joy from having being reinforced for doing a particular behavior. Today, though, we're going to answer the question of why did he ever want to do this in the first place? So before he had ever jumped out of, a, uh, of, the, out of that space pod in orbit, he thought this was a good idea. He thought this was something that he wanted to do. And he did a lot of behaviors to make it happen. He had to find sponsors. He had to find a crew to put together to figure all this stuff out. They had to build a pod. They had to put up in space. He had to go up there. There was tons of behaviors that had to be done before he could skydive from out of space. So why did he ever even want to do this, especially since he had never had a positive experience 
or any experience skydiving from outer space. So we're going to see how the peak shift effect can explain this bizarre behavior of wanting to skydive from outer space. And uh, for those of us who haven't sky uh, or don't skydive from outer space, we'll also apply it to a uh, more um, kind of uh, everyday example. And every, the everyday example we're going to take a look at is attractiveness. So if you uh, just Google um, most attractive uh, males in uh, Hollywood, uh, you'll come up with names like Ryan Reynolds. So there's the top half. There's the bottom half of Ryan Reynolds. And uh, you'll also come up with uh, names like Ryan Gosling. So there's Ryan Gosling as well. Incidentally, both from Canada. It's one of our main exports. Hot guys named Ryan is uh, one of our big things. But um, the question is, is why are people attracted to this type of a physical structure when statistically you do not have a lot of interaction with that type of a physical structure? So I don't care how much game you have. That's one in a thousand right there, right? Just statistically, that type of a body is very, very rare. So why are these rare physical traits? So males for these physical traits, why are rare physical traits in females oftentimes seen as being very, very attractive? And again, it doesn't matter. I mean, if you ever, if you doubt this at all, next time that it's summer, go to the beach and simply on a checklist, count how many people fall into that category versus how many people do not. And I guarantee you it's very statistically uh, small. So why is it that when you take a look at the most attractive females, Kate Upton comes up and this is Stephanie Knight, who I have never heard of, but she was number two on the list. So why is it that people find these uh, types of physical characteristics very attractive even though they have probably never had a reinforced experience with these bodies. All right, so let's go back to those abs right there. So if you dated somebody that looked like this and you had a wonderful time, right, you were reinforced for being in the presence of this discriminative stimulus. It then makes sense that later on you'll be like, you know what, I like guys with abs. Guys with abs, I'm kind of attracted to them. I've had great experiences dating guys who have abs. That's why I'm highly attracted to dating guys who have abs. Women with this kind of hourglass, 70% uh, waist to hip ratio, big breasted features. Typically, you will not have a lot of experience with these individuals. So why is it that people find that attractive? Why does this become a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement, even though we probably don't have a long history of being reinforced for interacting with people with this physical um, structure? So we're going to take a look at why we are pre-wired to have potentially unrealistic attractions to uh, physical characteristics that we have never actually experienced. All right, so it all comes down to the peak shift effect. That's the theory that we're going to use to try to explain these bizarre, bizarre behaviors. Why would somebody jump out of space uh, or skydive from space? Why would somebody be most attracted to these perfect physical specimens or these extreme physical specimens, even though you have not had experience with that before? So the peak shift effect starts off with stimulus generalization. And stimulus generalization for operant conditioning is it's similar to for the one we saw for classical conditioning. But stimulus for generalization for operant conditioning is the tendency for an operant response, a behavior, to be emitted in the presence of a stimulus that is similar to the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. So the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement that SD right there, that discriminative stimulus for reinforcement is the signal that a reinforcement contingency is in effect. So that discriminative stimulus for reinforcement is like the green light at, a, uh, at an intersection. 
It tells you that if you proceed through the intersection, you will be reinforced by getting safely to where you're going. The red light is a discriminative stimulus or punishment. It says that if you proceed through the intersection, you have a chance of being punished by either an accident or a ticket and not getting to where you want to go. So stimulus generalization is the tendency for an operant response to be emitted in the presence of other stimuli that are similar to the discriminative stimulus for uh, reinforcement that the organism was trained on. So let's take a look at that kind of graphically here. So let's say that you train Sniffy to do a lever press, but only when there was a 2000 Hertz tone. So if Sniffy pressed the lever and there was no tone, there'd be no food, you know, no food was being delivered. But as soon as that tone was sounded, as soon as you heard that, if Sniffy pressed the bar, here out, uh, out comes the food. So that was the only tone that Sniffy ever heard. If you then tested Sniffy on a variety of different tones, some higher than the ones that he was trained with, some lower than the ones that he was trained with, you would find that the number of responses or the intensity of the response is going to be highest to the tone that he was trained on. Right? So it would be highest to that 2000 Hertz tone, which was the tone that he was reinforced for pressing the bar while that tone was being played. However, other tones that are similar to that tone that he was trained with, they will also elicit this response. So if he is reinforced for the tone, if you play a tone, Sniffy will also start pressing that button. So that higher tone will emit or uh, will elicit a, uh, a, a response. Sniffy will start to press the bar, not as much as he does to the tone that he trained with, but still, uh, you know, to a different, to a um, lesser amount. And the more different the tone becomes, the lower and lower the rate of response goes. So the more different the tone is in either direction, the less and less Sniffy will respond or press the bar to that tone. So if you have a very low tone, Sniffy might still press the bar, but he's not really going to press the bar very much. All right, so that's stimulus generalization. The operant behavior doesn't change. Sniffy is still pressing the bar, but the frequency or the intensity or the amount that he presses the bar changes. And importantly, Sniffy will still press the bar to a sound that he has never heard. So he'll press the bar most to the sound that he was trained with, the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement, but other sounds that are similar will also lead to Sniffy pressing the bar. All right, so that's stimulus generalization. Any questions on that? All right, so we start with stimulus generalization. In this case, Sniffy either heard nothing or he heard the 2000 Hertz tone, right? So he either didn't hear sound, presses the bar, nothing happens, or he hears the 2000 Hertz tone, presses the bar, and, and uh, is uh, given food, reinforced with food. So what then happens to this gradient here when we start discrimination training? So let's say that after Sniffy has learned this uh, response, you press the bar when the 2000 Hertz tone is being played and you'll get reinforced. What happens if we then introduce another stimulus, another tone that is played where Sniffy is not reinforced for pressing the bar during that tone? That's called discrimination training. So in discrimination training, we press the 2000 Hertz tone that is a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. If Sniffy presses the lever, Sniffy receives food. In discrimination training, we would also, at random times, play a 1200 hertz tone, so a much lower tone. And when that tone is present, if Sniffy presses the bar, Sniffy gets no food. So this is discrimination training. If Sniffy can tell the difference between those two tones, what will happen is Sniffy will press the bar most 
for the 2000 hertz tone, but we'll recognize that he's not getting reinforced for the 1200 hertz tone and we'll stop bar pressing. So we went through discrimination training when we got our driver's licenses because we can tell the difference between a red light and a green light. So we have different reinforcements or different punishments based on uh, that uh, stimulus, that discriminative stimulus. All right, so this was a generalization gradient prior to discrimination training. What then happens to this gradient when you introduce the training on the 1200 hertz tone, and now when you play the 1200 hertz tone, Sniffy is not reinforced for the bar press. So we're still reinforced for the 2000 hertz tone, but now the new thing is he is not reinforced for the 1200 hertz tone. Well, what happens is the bar change, the graph changes, the gradient changes. He stops responding on the 1200 hertz tone, and we get a change in the gradient. So the 1200 hertz tone, where he is not being reinforced, went through an extinction procedure. Sniffy no longer presses the bar for the 1200 hertz tone. But notice, very interestingly, that the highest rate of response now does not occur to the discriminative stimulus for reinforcement that Sniffy was trained with. It actually occurs for a new stimulus that Sniffy was never trained on. Now the 2200 hertz tone is the highest tone, the peak of the uh, discrimination gradient or this, the generalization gradient has shifted, hence the peak shift effect. So importantly, Sniffy has never heard the 2200 hertz tone. He was only trained on the 2000 hertz tone where he received reinforcement for pressing the bar he was also trained on the 1200 hertz tone where he received nothing. It was extinction uh, procedure when he pressed the bar. And because of those two procedures, the peak of the generalization gradient has shifted away from the extinction stimulus uh, uh, to a new stimulus that Sniffy has never been reinforced on. So now Sniffy presses the most to the 22 hertz tone even though Sniffy was never reinforced for pressing the bar to the 2200 hertz tone. <coughs> All right, so that's the general version of the peak shift effect. So far, so good. All righty. Okay, so the peak shift effect, the peak of your generalization gradient following discrimination training will shift away from the standard deviation for reinforcement to a stimulus that is further away from the discriminative stimulus for extinction. So that's the peak shift effect. So how can we use that to explain Felix Baumgartner and his desire, his uh, wanting to skydive from a higher elevation? So why was it that skydiving from outer space became a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement? So that he said, oh, skydiving from outer space? Yes, 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 I want to skydive. I want to do that behavior. The same way Sniffy said, oh, we got a 2200 hertz tone? Yes, 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 I want to press that bar. How is it that that occurred for Felix Monger? Well, this bizarre behavior of jumping from outer space uh, basically comes down to basic psychological learning mechanisms. So, uh, and in this case, the peak shift effect. So we're going to have down here on the x-axis, that's elevation. I don't know what people skydive from, so just go with it. Uh, that's in meters. And then this we can see as uh, the desire to skydive. So how much does Felix Baumgartner actually want to skydive? And down here is low levels of wanting to skydive, up near the top, high levels of wanting to skydive. All right. So let's say that Felix Baumgartner only ever, and this is, this is not gonna be true, but just go with it for the moment. Let's say that he only ever skydove from an elevation of 2,000 meters. It's the only thing that he ever did. So from his very first time that he went skydiving, and he was like, oh boy, I'm new to this thing. I hope it's exciting. Where, how high are we going? They were like 2,000 meters. 
He's like, okay. And on his 10th time, he was like, oh, okay, it's my 10th time. I'm kind of getting a little bit of experience. How high are we going? They're like 2,000 meters. And he's like, okay. And on his 200th time, he's like, how high are we going? And they're like, same as always, 2,000 meters. And he's like, okay. So he jumps out of a plane at 2,000 meters. 2,000 meters is a discriminative stimulus. In this case, it's a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. So he jumps out of the plane at 2,000 meters, and he feels that adrenaline rush, and he gets the, reinforce, the, the intrinsic uh, reinforcement from the successful skydive. Uh, he gets reinforced for skydiving. So that elevation, 2,000 meters, becomes his discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. If one day he comes to that airfield and he says, all right, guys, I'm pumped. You know, let's go skydiving. And, and they tell him, yeah, okay, but today we're going to go to 2,200 meters. According to the stimulus generalization curve, Felix Baumgartner would say, well, 2,200, all right, I'd rather do 2,000. Maybe we could bring it down 200, but 2,200, okay, I'll still go. My desire is still pretty high. If, on the other hand, he came in that day and he said, hey, guys, where are we skydiving? How high are we going? Let's get up there. And they said, all right, today, for whatever reason, we're only doing 1,200 meters. He would say, wow, 1,200? Eh, you know, don't really want to do it. Don't really want to go. I'll go. It's better than nothing, but I have lower desire to go to 1,200. This is what would happen if Felix Baumgartner only ever went skydiving at 2,000 meters, all right? This is the generalization gradient that he would have in terms of his desire. It would be highest for, for jumping out of a plane at 2,000 meters because that's where he was reinforced. That became the discriminative, uh, discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. And it would be lower as you went higher than 2,000 meters or as you went lower than 2,000 meters. His desire would be lower. So that is a generalization gradient. But notice this whole time, I've been using a caveat. I've been putting in a modifier. And that is, if Felix Baumgartner has only ever jumped out of a plane at 2,000 meters. And that just does not happen. In our human experience, it is highly variable. And sometimes he would jump out at 2,000 meters other times he would jump out a little bit lower. Other times he would jump out a little bit higher. Whatever it was, there would be a variability in his experience. And because of that variability, he would also be differentially reinforced. So he might go up a whole bunch of times at 2,000 meters. And he jumps out of the plane, and he's like, woo, yeah, woo, adrenaline rush, feeling it, yeah, woo, having a great time. He gets reinforced for jumping out at 2,000 meters. They say that he goes up to 1,200 meters, and he jumps out of the plane, and he's like, ah, it's boring. Ah, 1,200, well, all right, you know, comes down. Doesn't get reinforced, all right? So different elevations are going to have different reinforcement. Some elevations are going to be exciting, like 2,000. Some elevations are going to be boring, right? He's going to jump out of the plane. He's going to have a horrible time. He's not going to get reinforced. That is like a reinforcement schedule and an extinction schedule. So let's say that he always used to go at 2,000 meters, and one day they say, you know what, we got to go up 1,200 meters. You know, sorry, it'll still be fun. And he jumps out of the plane, and he's like, that was boring. That wasn't fun. I did not get reinforced. He just went through an extinction procedure where he jumped out of a plane at 1,200 meters and did not get reinforced. This becomes a discriminative stimulus for extinction. This becomes a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. His desire to jump out at 1,200 uh, meters goes down. And then what happens is that because of his gradient, his generalization gradient, and the peak shift effect, his peak desire moves from 2,000 meters to an ele elevation that he has never jumped out of before. So after his first bad experience jumping out of a 1,200-meter plane, 
He's going to come back the next time. And if they say, Felix, your choice today, where do you want to jump out of? How high do you want to go? He's going to tell them, you know what? Usually I do 2,000. But today, for some reason, I've really got a desire to go to 2,200. I don't know why. I've never jumped at 2,200 meters before. But for some reason, I just kind of feel it. You know, that's the, re that's the one that I want to do. So that becomes his new peak. That's his new most desired elevation. And afterwards, again, because of variability, if he jumps a bunch of times at 2200 and he gets reinforced, and then he jumps a couple of times at 1400 and he finds it incredibly boring, this peak will shift again. And now he'll have a desire to go to 2400 meters, even though he's never been at 2400 meters before. So through discrimination training for being reinforced and turning these elevations into discriminative stimuli for reinforcement and being going through extinction and turning these elevations into discriminative stimuli for extinction, slowly but surely, 2400 seems like a great idea, 2600 seems like a great idea, 2800 seems like a great idea, and after a few years, outer space seems like a great idea even though he had never jumped from outer space before. Any questions about the peak shift effect and its explanation of Felix Baumgartner's desire to jump out of that um, pod that was in orbit? All right, so let's bring it back down to Earth, back down to physical attractiveness. So again, why in polls of the most attractive people in the world? Why in our own kind of attracted uh, or our own um, characteristics for what we find attractive? Why is it often that we will uh, uh, find things that are attractive that we have not had much experience with? So physical bodies that have six pack abs are not very common. Physical bodies with the dimensions of Kate Upton are not very common. And what that means is that you will not have been reinforced for dating people with those particular bodies. So why is it that people have a desire, have an attraction to, and, and listen to the English that was chosen for that, we have an attraction to these people. We literally want to do the behavior where we are close to them. Why is it that we have that desire, even if we have never experienced people with these particular physical dimensions? Well, once again, it goes to the peak shift effect and discrimination training. So on the x-axis here, we have hotness. So I've kept this general because different people have different things that they find attractive. So some people like tall people, some people don't. Some people like athletic people, some people don't. Some people like very intelligent people, some people don't, right? Uh, so whatever it is that you consider to be attractiveness, on this end, we have more of that characteristic. On this end, we have less of that characteristic. So let's say that when you started dating, and once again, this is going to be a little bit contrived, but just to simplify the situation. Let's say that you, when you were dating, you only dated people at level 2,000, right? At level 2,000 of hotness. So to make this a little bit more straightforward, let's say that this was height, right? These are very, very short people. These are very, very tall people. These are people kind of like in the, you know, in the middle, in, on, on uh, an average height. So if you only ever dated people that were 5'8", and you went out and you had a great time, and you went out and you had a great time, and your friends were like, oh, I'm going to set you up with this person, they're 5'8", and you went out and you had a great time, and you went to the bar and you met a person and they were 5'8", and you went out and you had a great time. If every person that you've ever gone on a date with was five foot eight, five foot eight would be your discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. Let's say that you had a great time every single time that you went out on that date. So if you interact with a five foot eight person, that behavior of interaction leads to reinforcement, leads to a good time, a good meal, good conversation, pleasant experience. That five foot eight height becomes a discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. So if you were looking at a group of people and somebody said, who's the hottest person in this group? Who do you find the most attractive? 
you would say, well, that five foot eight person over there, kind of doing it for me. That five foot eight person, I don't know, it's something about them. You wouldn't talk like that, but you would pick the five foot eight person because that's the one that you are most attracted to. That is the one that you would do that approach behavior to. Somebody that's 5'10", not so much, right? So you'd be like, well, I don't know, just something about them not, not quite as attractive. You know, I'd much rather that, you know, five foot eight person over there. Somebody four foot 10, not as much, right? So again, this is physical attractiveness that leads to approach behaviors. And this would be if you only ever dated somebody who was five foot eight and you were reinforced every single time, that became your discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. However, as we know, unless you are incredibly shallow, I'm just gonna say it, unless you are incredibly shallow, I mean, can you imagine somebody saying, well, you know, what's the perfect person for you? And they're like, well, five foot eight, that's my perfect person. And they're like, really, like a five foot nine person you wouldn't date? It's like, no, don't date five nine. Five seven, don't date five seven, date five eight. You, exactly, about as shallow as you can be. So let's say that, that that typically doesn't occur. And what happens is people date a variety of heights. People date a variety of whatever you think is, is hot. So a variety of heights, a variety of builds, uh, a variety of physical characteristics. What's going to happen uh, inevitably is on some of those dates, you're going to have good experiences you're going to be reinforced. So that approach behavior of spending time with that individual is gonna be reinforced with a really nice time. On other dates, you are not gonna have such a great time. Everybody's gone out on bad dates. That is an extinction procedure, right? You've gone out on that date, you were not reinforced. So let's say that you have gone out with nothing but people who are five foot eight. And the one time your friend says, well, oh, I got somebody for you and they're four foot 10. Just give them a shot, you know, give, give, them a, give them a try. And you're like, all right, fine. I don't have that much desire for the approach behavior, but all right, we'll do it. And they take you to the amusement park and you can't go on any of the rides together because you know, they don't, they don't quite make it. Uh, and you just have a horrible time. You just have the most boring, horrible time, what, you know, ever. That discriminative stimulus will become a discriminative stimulus for extinction. And what's going to happen is that your desire to go out with anybody who's four foot ten is going to drop to zero. So the next time your friend says, "All right, I know the previous one didn't work out. I got somebody else for you, four foot ten. Do you have any desire to go out with them?" You will say, "No, I have no approach behavior left. Four foot ten is my discriminative stimulus for extinction." But look what happened. All of a sudden, five foot eight is no longer the best discriminative stimulus for reinforcement. Now you got an attraction to somebody who's five foot 10. So now all of a sudden you're like, you know what? I've never given people who are five foot 10 a chance. I don't know why I was so blind all these years. Of course I should give somebody who's five foot 10 a chance. For some reason, there's just something about them it seems a little bit more attractive than it was before. So this is one of the reasons why people often get very extreme uh, um, attract or very extreme characteristics for attraction. So you can see how just randomly, right? Just random occurrences of not having good dating experiences with short individuals will lead your peak to shifting to higher and higher and higher individuals. So you might have liked five foot eight, but all of a sudden five foot 10, is looking the best. They are highly attractive. And then if you continue to have poor experiences here, because again, there's a variety of uh, people that you're dating, uh, all of a sudden, six feet is gonna look very attractive. And then if it continues to occur, all of a sudden, six foot two, six foot four, to the point where you know, you're watching the NBA or maybe the WNBA and you're like, oh my goodness, if I could only land myself, somebody who's six foot 10, you know, that would be it, that would be the, the ultimate thing for me. And other people are looking at you going, six foot 10, really? Like, that, um, you're like, that's what does it for you? And you're like, yeah, I don't know why. It's because your peak is shifted to that things that you importantly have never experienced. So this person will want to date that five foot 10 individual, even though they have never experienced or never dated 
that five foot ten individual. So that's a bit of a contrived example. I'll give you one that is a little bit more uh, realistic in terms of attractiveness, and that is on the dimension of assertiveness. So assertiveness, how outgoing you are, uh, how much you will stand up for yourself. There is uh, a certain amount of assertiveness that is uh, desirable, and then you can go over assertive or you can go under assertive, right? So there's an assertive, a certain amount of assertiveness where if you go out on a date with somebody and they have this much assertiveness, uh, you're going to be reinforced. You might have, you're probably going to have a good time. So if they go to the restaurant and the food isn't done correctly, a person at this level will be like, you know what, let's, we'll send the food back. You know, I'll talk to the waiter, I'll, I'll take care of it. We'll send the food back. And then you get your food and it's correctly done and you have yourself a nice, you know, evening. If you go to uh, a movie theater and uh, you're like, I prepaid for my tickets, I bought them online. And they're like, well, we don't have any record of that. You know, they'll step in and they'll be like, no, you know, here's the proof, here's this. And they're like, oh, okay, let's, you know, get you into that movie. You'll have a good experience with that much assertiveness. If you go into people that are slightly more assertive, Right. And people that are too pushy. Right. So people that, um, you know, when the food is incorrectly prepared, start chewing out the waiter, start calling over the manager, start asking for the chef to get fired Too assertive, Right. Your desire to go with them is going to be lower and lower and lower. Same thing with people that are not at all assertive. So can you imagine going on a date with somebody and you ordered the steak and you ordered it medium rare? And the steak comes, and, sorry, no, not even. The food comes and it's chicken and it's raw. And you're like, this is not what I ordered. I'm going to send this back. And your date is like, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to start any trouble. Don't, don't send it back. And you're like, no, I'm going to send it back. And you're like, no, no, no. I don't just, just eat it. Just, it is fine. And you're like, no, I'm going to send it back. I ordered something. I should get what I ordered. And they're like, you know what? Here, take mine. I'll take yours. I'll eat the chicken. It'll be fine. I just don't want to cause any trouble. No approach behavior for that level of assertiveness, right? Not enough. So once again, you would not date people with only a certain level of assertiveness. You would not, as part of normal dating behavior, meet somebody and say, you know what, can you fill out this assertiveness inventory here so I can measure your assertiveness? Because I like 2000, that's my sweet spot. That's what I've been reinforced for before. So you're gonna have an experience with a wide variety of people who are assertive at different levels. This individual, I guarantee you, you're gonna have a bad time on that date. So what's going to happen is this is going to become a discriminative stimulus for extinction. And people who are not assertive, who are pushovers, who are too wishy-washy, you're just not going to find them attractive. As soon as you kind of figure out that you know, they don't have any uh, will of their own, your approach behavior is going to go down to zero. But notice what happened. Now, all of a sudden, you want people who are a little bit more assertive, right? a little bit more pushy. And if you continue to have bad experiences on this side, your attraction is going to be pushed further and further and further towards the higher levels of assertiveness, the higher levels of aggressiveness. And this is oftentimes seen in our society when uh, people are attracted to convicted felons who are spending time in jail there are people who will become pen pals and highly attracted to this. On a lesser note, this is where the bad boy, bad girl stereotype kind of comes from, where you're like, oh, I'm kind of attracted to bad boys. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about them. I'll tell you what it is about them. It's your previous extinction experience with guys that are, or girls that are the opposite level of that spectrum. So if you ever find yourself strangely attracted to guys like this, who, uh, I don't have his name up there. Ah, this guy made the rounds on uh, social media a few years ago. His name is Meeks. Uh, he, his mugshot got released and uh, people went crazy over this guy. They were like, oh my gosh, he's so dreamy. He's so attractive. There's just something about him that I, you know, really, really like. Uh, he was charged with robbery and corporal injury to a child. Uh, he was convicted of federal charges of being a felon in possession of a firearm in grand theft. Massively assertive, right? And people knew this. They knew that he was charged. They knew that he was a felon. 
And still they were like, you know what? Just something about him, just something that I find very, very attractive. And what oftentimes occurs, again, is that if you have bad experiences with people that are unassertive, your peak desire is going to be continually pushed towards people that are more and more and more assertive. And all of a sudden, it gets pushed enough. You're looking at murderers and felons, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, there's just something about them. There's just something about that murderer that, uh, that does it for me. And uh, again, bizarre behavior, but very simple mechanism can explain it. All right, so that's all that we're going to do today. Next time, we're going to take a look at punishment and uh, continue on with our um, look at uh, uh, extinction uh, and uh, punishment.